So it's my great pleasure to have uh, Dr. Terry uh, DiCastillo from uh, the Firmlet as our uh, the same speaker today. So she's got uh, her uh, PhD degree from uh, Harvard University in 2019. And, uh, and then uh, she joined uh, the formula uh, as her postdoc. And uh, she's going to start uh, or open the sheet at the uh, University of Chicago from uh, the coming January. Uh, so she is working at uh, the CMS. And uh, today, uh, she's going to talk about the interesting uh, the subject, Roaming the product researches at the LHC. Thanks. Thank you for having me. Um, thank you for that nice introduction. Yeah, so I'll be talking about long lived particle searches at the LHC. Um, but I, like I said, I thought it would be fun if we started out with a little game, very low pressure game. Um, but I like to call it how many of these discoveries do you remember? Um, and so, yeah, just take a guess. Uh, what I'll do is I'll show an event display and I, it'd be great if you guys could shout out guesses about which particle was discovered, right? Okay, so let's start just to confirm, like people are gonna make guesses, right? Like raise your hand if you're willing to say something. I see three, four, come on. Five hands, six hands, nice. Okay, that's good enough. Oh, thanks. Very nice, yeah. So this is a positron. This is evidence for antimatter. Um, and it's a cosmic ray event in a cloud chamber with a magnetic field. So you're getting the charge based on, you know, the direction of its curvature. Okay. There are neutrinos in there, but not depicted. <laughs> this one is, this one is very, no one gets this one. All right. Okay, so um, yeah, so this is actually, I don't believe this is the event display that they show for the discovery, but this particular one was very useful for sussing out what was the pion and what was the muon. Um, and this is in a nuclear emulsion, also a cosmic ray event, um, where you can infer the different particle properties from their ionization, scattering, and or their decay products. Okay. Um, and as a hint this month, shows the name in this picture. Yeah, so this is um, Psi Prime going to two pines and a Jupiter Psi um, and discovery of the charm. Um, and so now we're colliding particles to produce new ones and our detectors are getting even more complicated. This is a spark chamber. All right. Yes. Yeah, this was the discovery of the gluon in three quark and three jet events um, at DAISY. And going from spark chambers to drift chambers, which are, you're able to read out faster. Um, also more granularity. All right, this one should be easy. Higgs, yeah, this is the discovery of the Higgs boson. Um, this is an event display from Atlas, seven TV collisions at the LHC. Um, and this is by far the most complicated detector we've looked at so far. Um, with millions of readout channels and, um, and, and extremely high event rates. Okay, so what are the takeaways that we learned from this game? Um, so for me, I mean, particle physics is beautiful. That's why we're in it, right? Um, but the first thing that I sort of take away from this is particle trajectories or their tracks are key to discovery. Um, so we've either directly detected new particles or learned about them from their decay products. Um, we've also, you know, over time graduated from different sources of new particles. So looking at particles in nature around us and actually producing them in high energy collisions. And then as we've done this, we've placed increasing demands on our detectors. So we need to disentangle more particles and we need to do it faster. So at higher rates. Okay. And I hope that's, if you get nothing away from this talk, that's the theme. That's how we discover new particles. Okay. So it's a bit of motivation. Um, I think we all agree that the standard model is not likely to be the complete picture of the universe. Um, things that sort of keep me motivated are, we know dark matter exists and it's likely to be a particle from our you know, astronomy cosmology friends. Um, we also have a growing list of anomalies, anomalies um, where our measurements are not agreeing very well with standard model predictions. Um, for example, mu on G minus two at Fermilab, 
um, and LHCb has some interesting results in the LHC. Um, and then on the theory side, we also have this question of naturalness for the hierarchy puzzle, which has to do with why is there such a large difference between the Planck scale and weak scale, and usually gets distilled down to why is the Higgs mass so low? Why isn't it pulled up by quantum corrections? Um, and together, I think all of these things say that nature is telling us there should be new fundamental particles. There has to be. Um, and strongly hinting that they should show up at the TV scale. Um, so what's the best way to look for new particles? I claim it's high energy colliders. Um, this is the Livingston plot where you look at, you know, collision energy as a function of year. And you can see that as we increase in energy, we're probing, you know, smaller energies, higher masses. Um, and it's been an exciting and effective way to discover new particles. Um, and that means today the best place to look for new particles is the Large Hadron Collider, which sits on the border of Geneva, Switzerland, and France, um, and makes proton proton collisions at um, four points along the ring. And I'll talk about um, the kinds of searches that we do for long lived particles in the general purpose detectors, Atlas and CMS. So I think uh, before you dive into any sort of particular analysis or kind of analysis, with these large experiments, you want to think about the data taking schedule because that really affects what kind of physics you want to do when. Um, so this is big LHC picture where the dark purple shows you when we're running roughly um, the collision energy and the integrated luminosity. So that um, basically is the number of collisions or the data set size that we're collecting. You can think about this and this is where we are today. So. In run one, we turned on, this was a big jump in energy with respect to the Tevatron, and we made the dis successful discovery of the standard model Higgs boson. Um, in run two, we roughly doubled our energy, and we've been analyzing that data set in great detail, but there aren't any obvious signs of new physics so far, um, particularly in the more conventional channels. And when I say conventional, I mean things like your MSSM inspired supersymmetry searches, your standard dark matter searches for signatures like a monojet, et cetera. And these are some of the many exclusions that we've made. Um, and then looking forward, we've just you know, started run three um, where we're getting a modest increase in energy, but more than doubling our data set size. And then we have the high luminosity LHC to look forward to where we're gonna get about a 10 times increase in, in data set size and upgrade our detectors. Um, but something sort of obvious stands out, which is that we're really transitioning from increases in energy to increases in luminosity. And so rules of thumb, your mass reach, so the, the mass of the new particle that you might be able to discover scales roughly with energy. Whereas when you're making more collisions at a fixed energy, you're probing rarer processes or smaller cross sections, smaller couplings. And so these sort of rare processes and smaller couplings, I think, are something that's very important to be looking for at run three. Um, and yes, so um, what does this mean for us? Like I said, LHC luminosity, this is gonna be a completely unique opportunity on the standard model side. Uh, so you can measure extremely rare standard model processes like triboson, which was something we've never really thought about before. You can make precision measurements of high statistics processes like CPLUS jets and really sort of make these powerful indirect, indirect probes of new physics. Um, you can also do direct searches for new particles. And so for run three in particular, the emphasis is on signatures that may have evaded detection. So they, they may have evaded detection because they're either low rate, they have a small cross section, for some reason they had low efficiency, um, large challenging backgrounds and or we simply haven't thought to look before. Um, and so when deciding between whether you wanna do a measurement or a search, um, part of this is your gut and your personality. And so for me, um, nature is telling us that new physics should exist, but maybe doesn't look the way we thought it should, we thought it would. And the LHC is a precious resource and we need to do everything that we can to make sure we don't miss any potential new particles, right? The status thing would be we're producing new physics at the LHC and we didn't discover it. Okay. So it's all about looking for things that we haven't looked for before. Um, so what were Atlas and CMS designed to do? Uh, so this is gonna talk a little bit about how those detectors work and what is well covered. Um, so the first thing to think about is when we produce particles at the LHC, 
um, they can decay to standard model particles. So for instance, we don't see the W boson, the Z boson, TOP, or the Higgs. They all decay with lifetimes less than 10 to the minus 20 seconds. Um, if you want to think about this in terms of a decay length, it's less than 10 to the minus 12 meters. There's no way we can measure that. Um, and this sort of line of thinking means that we assume most new particles we would expect to see at the LHC will decay promptly to high momentum standard model particles. Um, and you won't be able to resolve the decay point from where they're produced. So we're looking for particles coming out of the production point. And any dark matter that we're in, um, particles that we're producing are stable and non interacting. So this is sort of the assumption that underlines the design of our detector. Um, so this is a, this is CMS actually, um, but the idea is similar for Atlas, where you're trying to detect and measure all stable standard model particles. Our detectors have cylindrical geometry, you know, 10, 15, 20 meters in diameter, about 30 or 40 meters in length. Um, and you can see that we have different layers um, to try and do uh, different kinds of measurements. So the first thing to think about is the magnetic field, which we use to bend charge particles. And their, the amount of bending that they have tells us about their momentum. Um, and this sort of, all of the layers are built around this. So the collisions are produced in the center here and particles move out. The first thing that they encounter is the silicon tractor, tracker, which measures trajectories of all charged particles, um, mostly with silicon pixels and strips. Um, then you encounter the electromagnetic and hadronic calorimeters, which measure the energy of things like electrons, photons, and hadrons. Um, and it also stops all of these particles besides muons and neutrinos. And so then the final thing that you need to do is separate muons and neutrinos. Um, and um, we do that with a muon spectrometer, which is usually with gaseous detectors, um, which are confirming that your track is a muon, um, and also giving you a second measurement. Okay, so we put all of these layers together and that's how we figure out what's happening in our detector. So you can see sort of separating an electron from a muon and how that might look. Um, and then we can use all of the particles that we've reconstructed and try and build up more complicated objects. So for instance, when we produce a quark or a gluon at the LHC, it's producing collimated sprays of particles called jets. Um, and we can also try and infer the presence of non-interacting particles like neutrinos or dark matter as missing transverse momentum. So PT miss or ET miss. Okay, whoops. All right, so that seems easy, but there are some challenges that come along with colliding protons. Um, the first is that you can think of the LHC actually as a quark or gluon collider. Um, because we're probing distant scales much smaller than the proton. Um, and those quarks and gluons that we're colliding carry a fraction of the proton's momentum. The vast majority of our collisions are low momentum and not interesting. Um, and it's only every so often that you expect to have a hard collision. So you can see, for instance, the rate of producing a top quark or um, a top quark pair or a Higgs boson or even a hypothetical Z prime and how it goes from millions to trillions. Um, of, chance of collisions you would need to make to see just one of those events. So we have to collide protons um, extremely quickly and very often in order to see the kinds of physics that we want to see. Um, we make collisions every 25 nanoseconds and we have about 50 overlapping collisions per event. And so this is supposed to be, you know, a fun sketch of what that looks like in our detectors with slowed down. So you can see it like as proton munches are coming in, we're already colliding the, the current bunch. And as particles from the previous bunch are leaving, you know, we still have muons at the end of our detector when we're making the next collision. And then we already have those bunches coming in. So it's wild. And then you try and speed this up, up and pick out the Higgs. It's a very difficult problem. Um, and this brings us to the trigger, which is that we're making so many collisions so quickly, um, we're actually not able to store all of that data. And we also don't really want to, right? A lot of it is junk. So we can only store roughly one in 10 to the five events. Um, and what we call the trigger system makes this decision. It's very high stakes um, in real time, very quickly. So we do this in a two-step process. Um, the first step, you have about six microseconds to make a decision. Um, you need to do this in custom hardware. 
Um, we only have enough bandwidth to read out the calorimeter and the muon, and we have to use very simple reconstruction techniques or um, identification patterns to make that decision. And so then you can keep about one in 400 events. We call this level one. And then once you've reduced your event rate, you have more time to make your decision, um, 300 milliseconds on average. And then you have enough time to run standard reconstru reconstruction machines, uh, routines and software. Um, you can refine um, information, add some tracking and keep roughly one in a hundred events. And so this process works extremely well um, for all of those prompt time momentum processes that, that we sort of expected and designed our experiment for. Um, the trade-off is that if you're trying to look for something unexpected, you might have very low efficiency, in particular when tracks are the most conspicuous feature of your event. If you don't have a clear muon or calorimeter signal, you, you can't trigger on that event in the first step. Okay. And then once you've you know, triggered on your event, you can take advantage of the full detector to do really incredible things. Um, this is an example of a collision where we produce two Z bosons from different protons. And you can see going from the scale of the Atlas detector to how much we can resolve um, at the inside of our tracker. It's really beautiful. Okay, so that's what we've looked for. Now to what we weren't designed to look for. Um, and as a result, what is less well covered. And that brings us to long-lived particles, um, which, you know, historically they're a little bit unconventional, but in my opinion, they're extremely well motivated. Um, so if you think about a particle's lifetime, um, it's the inverse of its width. Uh, you can get a long lifetime if it's decaying via a small coupling, um, if it's decaying via a high mass virtual mediator, um, or if there's small phase space for the decay. Um, and if you look at this picture, you have two examples of long lived particles that we have in the standard model. That's how common this mechanism, these mechanisms are. Um, and so not only do they appear very naturally in the standard model, they also naturally come out of favorite BSM models that we have, uh, like supersymmetry models with heavy neutral leptons, a wide variety of dark matter or hidden sector models, um, and even more. Um, and so there are several strategies that we have for looking for long-lived particles at the LHC. So the first is looking for um, these particles indirectly, in particular if they're neutral. Um, and you're trying to resolve the decay um, from the point of collision. And you can do that with tracking information. So looking at distances of closest approach, reconstructing secondary vertices, um, or you can even use calorimeter information if you don't have tracking information and try and leverage the shower shape or the delay of the calorimeter signal. The second way you can try and detect them is look, at, look for charged particles directly. Um, so you would be reconstructing anomalous tracks, which are metastable on the scale of the detector. Um, they would be slowly moving if they're high mass. Um, and they would also have anomalous ionization. And if, if they decay inside the detector, you could also try and look for evidence of that, that decay as a handle. Okay. And so then we want to connect detector and lifetime just to orient ourselves. Um, so this is sort of mapping on CMS, the distance scales of the various detectors and how that would map to lifetime in terms of um, a particle traveling at the speed of light. So on average, the distance traveled is due to two effects. The first is the intrinsic lifetime of the particle. Um, so we call this C tau, that's your distance metric. Um, the next thing that we have to think about is the Lorentz boost or beta gamma, which is the ratio of the momentum over the mass. So if you have something very low mass and high momentum, it's very boosted um, and would travel further in the detector than something with the same lifetime. And then each particle's decay is actually sampled from an, uh, an exponential. So just because your mean decay length is inside the muon spectrometer doesn't mean that's actually where most decays would happen in your detector. So you need to choose your detector volume of interest very wisely. And so um, in this talk, I'm going to focus on directly detecting charged long with particles. And so if we take what we know about lifetime, we can try and figure out the geometric acceptance of our signature. Um, and so this is sort of your geometric acceptance for searches where you're looking for a charged long-lived particle that decays promptly, that's shown in black as a function of lifetime. If you were to look for a displaced vertex in the tracker, um, and then if you were to try and directly detect the charged particle 
um, using just the tracker or using the tracker and the nuance spectrometer that's in red and purple. And so you can see sort of the complementarity between all of these strategies and how you need to do all of them to, to cover the full lifetime space. Um, and then it's not just acceptance, you also have to think about our efficiency and that's really driven by everything else. Um, so this, you know, we have challenges with the trigger. Um, our signals might not look like something we plan to reconstruct. And we also have really unusual backgrounds with respect to standard analyses. We can't rely on simulation as much as they can. Um, so all of the infrastructure that we have in Atlas and CMS was really designed with quantum physics in mind. And so that means, um, you know, we're, you know, inputting a lot of creativity and person power to, to get good efficiency for these signals. Okay, so how have we looked for charged particles long, uh, charged long-lived particles so far at the LHC? So I'm gonna talk about two full run two searches from Atlas. Um, the first is called pixel DEDX. So this looks for highly ionizing particles in the pixel detector. And then the second I'll refer to as multi-charge. This looks for multi-charge particles, which are passing through the entire detector. And as a bit of a spoiler, um, the reason I want to talk about these is because they have a very interesting excess, right? So this is, you know, a histogram of the inferred mass of one of, the, of these particles that they're looking for in the detector. And you can see, you know, by eye that there's an excess of events that look suspiciously like signal. Um, and so the long-lived particle community is very excited and intrigued by this result, and we're trying to suss out what's going on. So hopefully by the end of this talk, we'll all have a better idea. Okay. So some theory motivation um, for this particular search. This is the pixel DVX search. Um, the motivation comes from supersymmetry. Um, and so there are a variety of models that they keep in the back of their mind. They try to design a search to be very inclusive, but you know, um, for the sake of evaluating acceptance and efficiency, they have three models they consider. The first is where you have long-lived gluiness in a split supersymmetry scenario. This gives you a long lifetime because of the scale suppression between the gluinos and the squarks. Um, the second, you have a long lifetime because your chargino has a small fit space, so small mass splitting between the chargino and the neutralino. Um, and then in the third, you have long lived um, partners, of, super symmetric partners of the lepton, and that's because they, are, they have a small coupling to what's called the gravitino. And so for non SUSY aficionados, um, Basically, what you can take away from this is that you'll have a wide range of cross sections, ranging, ranging from very high cross sections for the gluinos. You can target high mass things all the way down to the sleptons where you're targeting things at the order of a few hundred GeV. And you also have a bunch of different decay modes. Um, so, this is a really good set of signatures to design an inclusive search. And if you are more than just not a fan of Susie, but you actually hate it, just think about these as dark matter signatures. So there are a lot of dark matter scenarios where at the LHC you would produce a charged particle um, and then it would decay to standard model charged particle and some dark matter particles. So this is, you know, conceptually what we're looking for. Okay, so how do we identify heavy particles? Um, this is the beta block equation. Um, where you're looking at the mean rate of energy loss or DDX as a function of boost, that beta gamma. Um, and so heavy particles that we produce at the LHC are, are mostly produced at or near rest. So they have small beta gamma and they sit in the highly ionizing part of this beta block curve. Um, standard model particles tend to be light like on the order of a GeV or less and we're producing them or reconstructing them at a GeV or more. So they tend to sit in what's called this minimum ionizing space. So what the analysis tries to do is measure DDX um, for these massive charged particles and convert that to a beta gamma. So your DDX you know, scales with the charge squared over something like one over beta gamma between one and, and being squared. So you can extract your beta gamma, your boost there, and then if you also make a momentum measurement, you can convert it to the mass. Um, so basically the takeaway is your DDX tells you about the mass of the particle. Okay, so how do we trigger? This is the first problem for any long lived search. Um, there's no tracking information at level one and tracks are really the only key feature of these kinds of events. Um, so what do we do? And it turns out that in most of the scenarios considered by the analysis, 
you have some missing transverse momentum or missing transverse energy that you can use to trigger. So if we look at these different scenarios um, where the long-lived particle, say, is passing through the calorimeter, um, it won't get stopped by the calorimeter usually, and your long-lived particle is reconstructed as missing transverse momentum. Um, in the scenario where your LLP is decaying before the calorimeter and there are no invisible particles in the decay, that's the only scenario where you're not getting missing transverse energy. And then if it's decaying to invisible particles anywhere, you're definitely getting mis uh, uh, missing transverse energy. So this trigger strategy has, you know, across a model, say 30% trigger efficiency. Um, it's very inclusive in terms of the different kinds of models they're targeting, and it's also the most efficient way to trigger on, them, on these long-lived particles in terms of lifetime, right? Um, for instance, people think about using a single muon trigger, but that's only sensitive if your LLP is sticking past the muon spectrometer. Okay, so we've triggered. Now we need to reconstruct our signatures. Um, and we can use standard track reconstruction, um, which sort of happens in the following way in the Atlas. So there are three tracking detectors. The first is the pixel, and you have strips. These are silicon. And then finally, you have straw tubes. And so the first thing you do is you want to take a collection of hits that looks like a track. So they look for triplets or three hits in the pixel or strip detectors. Once you have a seed, you want to extend it and look for hits in what's called a track road. And then you want to uh, then you want to take all of the hits that you found and found, find the best fit track that's in there. Um, this is all done in the silicon. And then eventually, it's extended into the, the straw tubes. Um, and this also roughly gives you a sense of the length of tracks that we're looking for. So half a meter up to about a meter. Um, and some rules of thumb to keep in mind with Atlas is that, you know, if you want a high quality track, so you want something that's well measured with a low fake rate, um, you need at least three hits in the pixel detector um, and at least three out of four of these strip layers for a high quality track. Um, you definitely need good pixel measurements in order to assign your track to a particular primary vertex. Um, it's also the detector that's making the charge measurement. You need the strips for PT resolution. Um, and then, especially at high pileup, the straw tube extension is very nice. It gives you roughly, you know, anywhere between two to four better PT measurement, um, but it's not necessary. You already have a very low fake rate and a well-measured track with just the silicon. Okay, so this is sort of the kinds of tracks we're selecting. Now we need to make a charge measurement. Um, and so the way that this works is um, this is a sketch of a pixel detector. Um, we are, we are, it's basically a diode. We're applying an electric field across it, sweeping away free charge. So when an incident particle passes through it, it's generating electron hole pairs, which are drifted by the uh, electric field to the readout strips and induce a signal. Um, and so the signal, you know, roughly looks something like this um, for if, if you have a high amount of charge deposited or a low amount of charge deposited. And what you can do is use the time over some predefined threshold to estimate your charge. Um, and so we get these time over threshold measurements in each of the pixel layers. Each of those measurements is sampled from a Landau distribution and you can take them and measure, sort of get a best measurement of the DEDX for your track. Um, and because, you know, Landau distributions have a long tail, you want to drop the highest DEDX measurement that you have um, to try and, you know, avoid inducing background by sampling the tail too much. Okay. So, again, sounds easy, but the really like the biggest challenge for this analysis, I would say there are two really big challenges. The first is actually calibrating the DDX. So there are several things to keep in mind. The first is that the measured DDX, DDX from the detector is really sensitive to running conditions. Like if you change your thresholds, if you do a new calibration, um, also as a function of time, we're irradiating our detector. So the, the pixels are collecting less and less charge. You can see that here actually. Um, and so you need to do a calibration to make sure that your detector is returning a consistent DDX as a function of time and, and position. Um, and so they do that calibration and they also do a lot of validation to make sure that simulation is matching um, the DDX that we would expect to see in our detector. Um, and then 
uh, what you need to do is actually make a map of DVX to boost. Um, so you're mapping charge to your boost. And the only source of highly ionizing particles that we have at the LHC from the standard model is low momentum standard model particles. So you need to go as low as about 100 MeV. Um, normally, we're only looking at tracks up to a GeV. And so going lower in PT is really challenging in a high pileup environment. So they do this with a dedicated low pileup run. Um, and what they do is they slice tracks in, in momentum. Um, so taking, say, this, this uh, distribution here and making a vertical slice. And then what they do is they find the most probable value of the DDX, the charge um, for pions, kaons, protons, and deuterons. And so you can see sort of those separations of those four different kinds of particles. And so once they have the MPV, um, they use the momentum of the, the track, the known mass to map DDX to beta gamma. Okay, so let's sort of walk through the event selection once you've calibrated your DDX. So at the LHC, you're starting with all standard model charge particles. To get rid of them, you want something that's high momentum, pretty central, isolated and with large DDX. That gets rid of a lot of background, many, many orders of magnitude. But after that, um, there are still some things that you know can enter into your selection. The first is electrons, and they try and get rid of electrons by um, rejecting particles which have you know, a large uh, deposit in the electromagnetic calorimeter. Um, something else to think about are pions that are highly boosted and produce in-site jets. Um, or even taus, which decay hadronically and also have hadronic activity around them. So this is sort of another form of isolation requirement that's made. Something else that can be a problem is if you have overlapping tracks. So there are sort of two scenarios where you, you look here and you can see that maybe a, a resonance that's highly boosted might have some overlapping tracks earlier in the detector and then it gets separated later. Um, or you could have low momentum charged particles, which are overlapping with your track of interest and inducing, you know, DDX, which is roughly twice as high as a standard model particle. Um, and so they get rid of these backgrounds by making really strict requirements on the number of hits, which are shared between multiple tracks. Um, and then something else that can be a problem is you can overestimate the momentum of your, your track that can give you a sort of high mass measurement. All right, so those are the selections they apply. What's left um, at the end of the analysis in your signal region, um, you basically, you're sampling from high momentum isolated hadrons and muons, which are just happen to be in the tail of your Landau. Um, and then at that point, there are kind of two approaches that you can take. You can optimize for discovery. And when you do that, what you want is um, nice inclusive regions, which are very easy to interpret. So they call these discovery regions where basically all of the tracks are taken. Um, they're just separated into a high, de a high charge and a low charge category. Um, the next thing that you can think about is, all right, in the absence of a signal, what's the most optimal way to set an exclusion? And so there you want to be binning in different S over B, uh, signal to background ratios um, to try and sort of leverage shape information or differences between the two. So the first division that you could think about making is, is my track matched to a muon or is it not? Is it a muon or is it a pion? So that's the first divi uh, division they make. Um, muons actually are a much larger background than pions at the end of their signal region. Um, so that's a higher background category. It targets lower lifetimes, whereas the tracker only scenario has very small background, like roughly a hundred times less background and target shorter lifetimes. Then you can make that same categorization in terms of the charge that's deposited. Um, so you have those same uh, DDX categories, but there's also basically an overflow flat in the first pixel layer when, you're, um, <clears throat> when your charge is three times that of a MIP. And so then you see this is sort of going from low background to high and targeting different masses. All right. so. You have your signal regions defined, you need to estimate your background. We cannot do this from Monte Carlo. So what they do is they generate toy. Sorry, what is this? So the first pixel layer was put in later, right? Um, so it's different from the three other layers. 
The three outer layers can measure up to about 10 times the charge of a minimum ionizing particle. And if you go over that, the hit is lost. Um, you get position information from surrounding pixels in what would be the cluster. The innermost layer is thinner, and it can only measure up to a charge of about three times a minimum ionizing particle. And if you go above that, an overflow flag is set. And so that's basically the difference, right? There's an overflow flag in the first layer, and there isn't in the outer ones. There's also a difference in um, the length of the detectors, how much they've been radiated, et cetera. It's just different. OK. So we need to estimate our background. Um, and the way to do this is generating sort of toy data um, and basically sampling different distributions to try and figure out what the background would look like. So they sample um, the momentum and the pseudo rapidity of tracks, which have low charge, so, so it's free of signal um, and kinematically similar to, to the signal. Um, and then they sample the charge information from low momentum tracks. And what they do is they take the momentum in the DDX and they compute mass of toy, the sort of toy data, and they normalize the distribution they get to low mass data where um, signal has already been well excluded and it's safe to normalize. And they also validate the method by looking at high eta, which isn't considered by the analysis. You don't expect much signal to be there. Um, and at low track momentum, also where you don't expect much signal. And these validation regions look quite good. Um, the fundamental assumption of the background is that for standard model particles, charge and momentum are not correlated. So something to keep that in the back of your mind. Okay, and so the results, I showed this before, um, but there's a very large excess of events for masses above about a TeV. Um, the analysis expects roughly um, half an event plus or minus 50%, um, and there are seven events observed. This translates to a 3.6 local excess and a 3.3 sigma global excess. I think this is the largest global excess at Atlas and CMS currently. Um, and it's, yeah, and it just, it really looks just like signal. So what's going on here? Um, the first thing that you wanna do once you have an excess like this is start looking at the events, look for data quality issues, um, see if you did anything wrong in the analysis, see if they're all similar, see, just trying to understand what's going on. So what they do is they look at these events in great detail in event displays, um, and they look mostly like this, where you have a high, initial, a high momentum initial state radiation jet recoiling against your track and your missing transverse energy. Um, then they look at the tracks themselves. Five of them have uh, a track in the muon spectrometer, can be thought of like muons. Um, and two of them look like just tracker only tracks. Um, most of them do not have overflow bits or the, that flag that's done in the first layer. Um, only one does. This is roughly the measure of mass and momentum and DDX that they see, all kind of consistent with a heavy charged particle. Um, and your DDX is mapping to a beta, so a velocity of about 50 to 60% the speed of light. But what's really interesting is that when you measure the time of flight of these particles using the calorimeter or the muon system, that time of flight measurement maps to one. So there's some really strange inconsistency that is happening, and it's very unusual. Um, so what do we think is happening here? Um, the cynical side says, I think this is an issue with the background estimation. Like maybe we're forgetting some background, maybe the assumption that momentum and charge is not correlated is wrong. And actually the analysis has this systematic on a correlation between um, charge and momentum. And you can see this is the purple line here as a function of mass. And you can see it goes up to about hundred um, percent, which is crazy. So if they're underestimating that systematic or not applying a correction that could easily give you a bump in your mass distribution. Um, or maybe it's an unexpected signal. So maybe you can explain away the time of flight being close to one um, by looking for a multi-charged particle, right? Your DDX scales as your Q squared, basically. Um, and so if you have a charge equals two particle, um, you match the ionization that the analysis is measuring as well as the time of flight. So this is sort of the, the mapping between a charge one and a charge two particle in this 2D space. And the and a highly boosted charge two particle fits the data quite well. 
All right. And so it just so happens that soon after Atlas puts out this DDX analysis, they also put out a search for multi-charged particles, um, which uses the full detector. Uh, so this was very exciting for people to see. Um, and so what happens is this is fairly generic. You can produce any multi-charged particle this way um, by a drill yon or photon fusion. Um, and your cross-section is basically scaling with the charge of the particle. Um, they use a mix of single muon and missing transverse energy triggers. Um, they look for an apparent momentum of PT greater than 50 GeV. They use the same pixel measurement as the previous analysis, but they're adding information from the straw tube, so the outer part of the tracker, and the muon spectrometer. Um, but what's really weird is that instead of just using the DDX measurement, they compute what's called a DDX significance. So they take the DDX measurement and subtract it from the mean DDX of a muon um, in xenomu mu decays. And they divide this by the width of uh, this sort of muon distribution. And so I, <laughs> I think people are really confused about what this means, right? A Landau distribution doesn't have a width. Um, it's very unclear which values they're using for the mean and for the width. So it's not clear how this significance estimator translates to an actual DDX. Um, and, oh, I don't know how to move this. There we go. Um, and it's also not clear if these variables are, are calibrated at all. The DDX analysis goes into painstaking detail about how they calibrate DDX as a function of run and position in the detector. And it's really unclear if this is done for any of these significance estimators at all. So I think a lot of people are very confused about what the analysis is actually cutting on. That being said, um, let's look at the results that they published. So for charge equals two, um, there were four events observed and roughly one and a half plus or minus one expected. So consistent with expectation. Same thing for charge greater than two. They had two different selections. Um, based on what uh, Atlas has told us, the selection is tighter than the pixel DDX analysis. Um, none of the events observed in pixel DDX are observed in the signal region of this analysis. Um, so what they do is they set exclusions and they exclude charge two particles up to about 1.2 TeV. And so if you compare this to sort of the, the best fit of the first analysis in a model where you would have highly boosted charged particles, um, you're still, you still have some favored phase space allowed. So this model basically is you have a heavy parent on the order of about a TeV, uh, multi-TeV decaying to two multi-charged particles, and that's why they're boosted. Um, and you can see this is, if they fit the DDX, the PT and the momentum, this is the best favored phase space by the first analysis. And then the red is the excluded phase space by multi-charge, but there's still space that's allowed. So the mystery has continued. Um, and we're all very confused as to what's going on. So what can we do as scientists? Um, I think the highest priority for Atlas and CMS right now is to look at the already collected run through data and try and understand, did we miss any potential backgrounds from overlapping hits, say from loopers? What did the individual DDX hits look like in each track? Are they higher in the lower layers or are they higher in the outer layers? Um, there's also this question of, when you look at the beta block curve, there's a logarithmic rise at high um, boost. Is, is something going on there? Why doesn't the analysis observe that effect? You could think about trying an alternative background estimation and cross-checking with the original one. Um, I think there's also a lot of questions surrounding how the multi-charge analysis was done. Um, if the detectors can actually measure charge that high um, and trying to understand the overlap between the two analyses a little bit better. Um, so that's sort of the cynical questions one can ask. Then, you know, you could say, okay, if this is signal, can we make a discovery with run through data already if we design a smart signal region? Um, so this would be looking for events passing missing transverse momentum and muon triggers, separating things into track and muons, um, incorporating the time of flight in addition to charge, and deciding, you know, can we extract both the mass and the charge of the particles? Why are we doing just one of these things for the analysis, what's going on? The other thing you can try and understand is if you're producing one or two long low particles per event, all the production mechanisms tend to favor two. Um, and then the, the biggest question is, what does CMS see? And so unfortunately, the most recent CMS result is from 2016. It just uses a part of the 2016 data set. 
Um, and it doesn't you know, have sensitivity that reaches this analysis, which uses the full run two data set. So this is something to watch for sure. Um, and Atlas is also planning to do a follow-up where they're really trying to dig into the details of what happened. Um, you can also try and make uh, some improvements with run three data, right? Run three is a, a great time to make short, uh, you know, modest improvements to our detectors and reconstruction. So for Atlas in particular, um, they spent a lot of work optimizing their tracking reconstruction, particularly so that they could add more tracking into the trigger. Um, so in run two, they were only able to run tracking in regions of interest identified by level one, and now they can run full event tracking and they can also run displays tracking in their trigger. So this is a major change for Atlas. Um, and they do this mostly by improving the first stage, the seed finding stage. So they're doing a better job of finding seeds and rejection, rejecting ones that don't look good. Um, and basically what can happen is you can use a level one momentum threshold um, and make a displacement or an anomalous track requirement at HLT, and you're improving your trigger efficiency by roughly about a factor of 10 in, in the vast majority of, of long-lived cases, um, which means that you're gonna do about 10 times better with run three than you would with run two. So this is a big deal for the long-lived community. I have a question. Yeah. Two times speed up in the chat, how does this relate to the MSC? So if your track reconstruction run, runs for a long time, you won't fit within the time allotted at the high level trigger. It, it'll be running too long and you'll get sort of like a buildup of events that you're trying to process. Um, I think, I believe that events which run for too long at the LHC, usually they're rejected, but we don't let ourselves get into that situation, right? Like that kind of thing causes a busy signal. It like disrupts data taking. So they wouldn't allow full tracking in the full event in run two. They only did it in small regions of interest. Now that you can run it in the full event, you might imagine passing a missing transverse energy trigger and then looking for one of these high momentum tracks. And you can keep the level one missing, missing ET trigger threshold instead of the HLT trigger threshold, right? So that's kind of, you can minimize the gap between HLT and level one. Um, and very often that gap is about a factor of 10. Okay. And so we've also, we're, we're already a year into run three. And so we've started to look at run three data. And so this is, you know, just some nice event displays from Atlas. Um, the LHC had its longest run ever. Um, we've collected quite a bit of luminosity um, and even started making some interesting measurements. Um, Longer term, we're going to be making massive upgrades to our detectors and triggers for the high luminosity LHC. Um, and so on the CMS side of things, there will actually be tracking information at level one for the first time. And that's really enabled by the specific geometry of the tracker. Um, so instead of having a single layer of silicon, there will be two nearby layers. Um, and in the in a magnetic field, you can actually look for coincidences which are consistent with high momentum tracks. Um, this enables enough bandwidth or data reduction that you can reconstruct all tracks with PT greater than 2 GB at level one. Um, and so you could imagine designing a trigger which directly selects a, a PT greater than 50 GB um, charged particle at level one and reduces enough background um, that you can pass that trigger. So this is a major deal for searches for charged long-lived particles, and it's also going to be extremely useful for some of the displaced decays as well. Um, the the trade-off is that there's going to be so much data at the HLHC, so many pixels with hits and so many more pixels, um, that we're going to be reading out reduced charged information. So instead of, say, eight bits of information with a larger dynamic range, so like up to 10 times MIP charge, we're only gonna be reading out um, to lower charges and with lower resolution. Um, the trade-off is that all of our detectors, both detectors will have improved timing resolution. So you can use time of flight with this reduced charge information to try and look for these particles. Um, but so that brings me to the end. Um, I hope I convinced you that long-lived particles can evade standard search strategies. Um, new physics, new particles could be hiding in our existing and future data sets. Maybe there's a hint of new physics in these pixel DDX searches. Um, and I do think the future is bright, especially for these long-lived searches. Um, there's a lot of new interest in pushing the boundaries of our detectors to discover this difficult to find physics.
Okay, so questions for Terry. Yeah, very nice vision. So uh, when you were showing those APIs in the past, you uh, looked at some, only one of them had this uh, overflow with what could it be in the situation, I guess. I don't know if I have that plot in back up. But so like if, if this I don't know, interaction of these eight events is a real signal. I didn't put that plot in backup, but basically, yeah. So yeah, so the the fraction of, of the fraction of hits with the overflow flag as a function of DDX measured by the other layers, basically it sort of turns on at about three times the charge of a minimum ionizing particle. But it's a slow turn on, and it's also, you know, you do like the statistics of what you expect. I don't think it's super unusual that you wouldn't have a lot of overflow flags. Um, also, you know, if you think about the, the inner layer of the trackers, you know, it's a very high density environment. There are sometimes modules that are turned off um, or aren't working. So you may just not have a, a hit expected there at all. I don't remember what the expectation was. Yeah, um, but that is definitely a good question. So some, so a big question that CMS folks have for the Atlas folks is, can you even access the DDX of the individual layers, right? Um, normally there's so much data produced that we need to run reconstruction to, you know, only save tracks instead of all of the hits um, on the analysis for the analyses that we're doing. And maybe Atlas is throwing away the individual hits on track and we don't even know that information. Maybe they're just using the, the sort of truncated average when they're making these predictions. So that's another thing that's gonna be more challenging as we collect even more data. Mm -hmm. I, was gonna, I don't think I followed the background estimation super well. And I was curious about how you assign uh, sorry, the systematic uncertainties to the background estimation. Yeah, that's a, that is a very good question. And it, yeah, it's definitely very difficult. So, um, right, so what they're doing is they're trying to get a mass distribution for the standard model background, right? And they need to do this in regions where there isn't much signal. So the first way to go to a place without much signal is to go to low charge, low DDX tracks. The kinematics of that region is you know, it's pretty similar to, to the background. Um, so it has momentum distribution and aided distribution of the, the background in the signal region. So you can sort of store a momentum and an aided distribution from that region. Then what you can do is try and figure out where can I get charge distribution from my background. And when you go to low momentum tracks, you have roughly, because these things are minimum ionizing, you have roughly the same DDX as your signal region. And it's also background free. So now you have three distributions and what you can do is try and generate tracks where you say, okay, I'm gonna randomly sample an eta, a momentum and a charge. And then you can use that information to reconstruct a mass for your toy track. You make enough sampling, you do enough sampling so that you get a distribution and then you normalize that distribution at low mass. So that's how the background reconstruction works, background estimation works. Um, Sorry. Those are and yes, this is the thing. So they assume these things are independent. Um, and it is very unclear like, how much we actually expect DDX to be uncorrelated from momentum. And they do some checks where they, like, they'll slice different variables. Um, and that's where that systematic comes from. And you can see it sort of grows at high mass. So something to keep in mind is that this 100% is evaluated with my understanding is very low statistics. So it's actually, to me, it's unclear if it's 100%, 0%, 1,000. Like, I have no idea what I would expect to be because there weren't enough statistics to make some meaningful statement. Um, but they, I think they do their best to validate the method. So, you know, looking at high ADA and at low momentum, and, and they get very good agreement. Like, there's nothing you can complain about by eye. Um, so informally, CMS is really struggling with the background estimation and getting it to work. So it's very clear that there's something challenging about it that maybe we're missing. Are there other questions? Um, what's the background for my charge uh, search? Next one. 
so it's the same kind of it's the same kind of thing um it's standard model particles where you happen to be in the in the, the tail of your landau and so instead of instead of using the momentum and the charge to do a background estimation they use these different ddx measurements they say okay you know it's a random probability you get high DDX, high DDX measurement in the pixel. It's uncorrelated with the DDX measurement in the muon system. So let's use those two variables and an ABC method to do a background estimation. And that, that appears to work. And I think it's very believable um, because you do expect those measurements to be uncorrelated for background. Um, yeah, so if you were looking for a charge equals one particle, the best fit mass is 1.4 TeV. Um, but if you're looking for a charge two equals particle, the best fit mass is on the order of like 500, 800 GeV. That's just very boosted. So any further questions? Uh, Cardi? Uh, I have a question. Uh, mm -hmm. So I'm always going to uh, the link for it. It's always that. So do uh, you think, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the machine learning techniques would increase the uh, uh, the signal acceptance, uh, just so that it uh, you know, improve the, uh, the significance of something like that. Yeah, so I don't, I don't think I would use a machine learning technique for the final analysis, but you could imagine doing something at the track object level. Um, so you could imagine trying to reject poorly reconstructed tracks with machine learning, and then you'd have enough statistics to do some training. Um, actually, some of the improvements in the Atlas trigger. So like improving your seed selection, this is actually done with machine learning now. They, they take some simple observables related to those three hits, the triplets, feed it to a machine learning algorithm, and the machine learning algorithm says, this is a good seed, this is a bad one. And it speeds up the decision as opposed to making some selection on all of them. Uh -huh. Yeah, so I think at a low level, you could do something. Mm -hmm. I, wouldn't, I wouldn't use machine learning for like the charge estimates, say. I think you want something simple and understandable. Okay. So, the or high luminosity, the effect only largely the radiation damage is special pixel detectors. So, how much effect uh, this kind of high luminosity bring to this analysis? That's a really, that's a very, very good question. So, someone did a study um, incorporating some of the changes that we expected our detectors. So I think CMS did a study. It doesn't account for the new trigger information, but it does account for the reduced charge information. And the sensitivity is about four times worse than the current detector. I don't know. I think they assume you can calibrate radiation effects away, like the current analysis does. Something to keep in mind is that the pixels will be replaced um, because the radiation damage will be replaced between run four and run five. Um, so hopefully it's not a, a point where all of the, the pixels are dead, right? Um, but yeah, it's a very complicated picture, right? Because in CMS, you can have basically a 100% efficiency trigger, um, but you have reduced charge information. And then you also have 30 picosecond time resolution, which is an excellent, it's an excellent mass estimator. Um, so I think CMS will be fine. The question is how much Atlas will do because they won't be able to trigger at level one. And they won't have 30 picosecond timing resolution everywhere, and they might have 100 picosecond timing resolution. Um, and they have the same charge information as they're using the same front end. So yeah, it's going to be, I don't know, it's going to be very interesting. And something I'm wondering is, you know, how late is it in the game, in the upgrade game, for us to do something better for, for these analyses, right? I think if CMS sees an excess, then you have a very convincing reason to try and put more information in and see what you can do. If CMS doesn't have an excess, I don't know how convincing that'll be. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay, so any other questions for her? 
If not, uh, the rest thank you. Thank you.